think we can start. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Fabrizio Felice. I was uh, Soho project manager between 1992 and uh, the spring of 1996 when uh, Soho was given to the scientists and to the flight operation team in NASA. I want to share with you uh, as an introduction to the major presentation by Daniel Mueller about the results of Soho, the scientific results of Soho. Share with you some uh, reflections and, uh, you know, memories, uh, those left at least after 20 years. Uh, before I do that, I would like to thank a few people that, thank you, the, who uh, helped in setting up this and uh, especially the other little event that you see at the entrance uh, in the Winter Garden, where you're welcome until, I think, Friday. Uh, and these people are Battle de Jong here with audiovisuals, uh, Jerko Heinen, who helped for the printing of uh, uh, several scientific posters, Sarah Humphreys of uh, the documentation, uh, Grace Smith of uh, uh, TechSys, uh, and uh, above all, Bernard Fleck. Bernard is our resident uh, scientist, uh, project scientist in Goddard since many, many years, I think 20 actually, <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, and uh, he has been, uh, he is always a source uh, of unbound enthusiasm about Soho after 20 years. He helped a lot also with the visuals, with the posters and so on. And he remains the best ambassador of Soho that, uh, that uh, we can have. Um, let me uh, tell you also another couple of things. I, I'm not, to, as you see, I'm not going to have a presentation per se. The, you can find a lot of uh, a lot of information about the story and the results of Soho on the internet. Uh, you just uh, uh, type Soho NASA, Soho ESA, or something like that. And it's a very well organized, uh, uh, very extensive uh, uh, site. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, I would like, uh, however, to start with uh, uh, a, a statement. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, um, I would also like to maybe it's not so clear from the images on, on the, on the uh, display, that SOHO is not an old mission th which died, which had, had a lot of good results, but died. So is an active spacecraft after 20 years. It gets, uh, connect, uh, you know, gets, uh, bumps its data to ground uh, every day, every about three months, you know, uh, exercises the maneuver to correct the orbit and to decelerate the wheels and uh, has people that uh, need this data, we will see them later, uh, need this data uh, for uh, solar storm predictions. So we are not talking about, you know, uh, something which has passed its prime. The spacecraft is, uh, is, uh, is uh, functioning well, still after 20 years. Uh, in terms of memories, uh, let me uh, uh, make a bold statement. I think that SOHO is uh, lucky. Uh, one may say, what well, is luck to do in a place like this, full of uh, engineers and scientists that uh, say, well, luck uh, has no, must have no meaning. But how do you uh, then uh, mm, describe what happened about three weeks before the nominal launch on the 2nd of December 1995? We were in the first launch attempt, uh, T minus 10, 70 seconds, uh, suddenly the plof, launch, the launch scrub. The, uh, the, the director calls off the, line, the launch. What was the problem? Uh, pressure regulator, very old, very reliable design. And uh, within an hour, they, had, they knew what, what, what it was. So within two hours, they had it out of the rocket. Within a night, it was uh, on the other side of the United States. And within a week, they had replaced it. The problem was uh, a, a piece of mylar, was a diaphragm which had been, which had been uh, uh, breaking. Uh, because it was not minor, it was uh, a different uh, material because of a change in, uh, in production. Uh, it was restored, uh, the, there was no problem, uh, and we launched uh, then on the 2nd of December. But, but what had happened at T minus 70 seconds? And on that line, nothing. Why did it break at T minus 70 seconds? Nobody knows. There was no transient, uh, no, pa no spike, no peak, no, no nothing. It could have broken 75 seconds after, you know, dis destroying, destroying Soho, the rocket, and probably the path. So, luck. But luck is not enough. For instance, when 
uh, Soho in uh, June 1998 uh, was uh, uh, lost because of uh, erroneous maneuver and was left, in fact, uh, tumbling uh, over uh, one of the axes without uh, usable power, without uh, connection with the ground. Then, uh, uh, you know, having in ESA uh, a team which was knowledgeable enough of the spacecraft system to be able to start proposing immediately uh, you know, solutions or possible ways out of this uh, terrible situation uh, was paramount. And within 36 hours, enough people and enough uh, resolve was in the States across the Atlantic uh, to persuade, uh, uh, first of all, to cheer up the flight operation team, which was, of course, uh, desolated, but also to start, you know, nudging heavily on uh, NASA uh, to, to get his is uh, important resources, uh, especially the big 64 meter antennas of uh, the Deep Space Network. And, uh, and then later on, even the Arecibo uh, the radio telescope, which was the first one to spot to say that Soho was in a certain place, and which boosted a lot the morale of everybody. Uh, so in this case, uh, the, it was uh, effort, a lot of effort, the, the, the team there uh, which stayed there for three months, uh, uh, you know, uh, was with a very hard, very painstaking, very dicey sometimes situation. There were some guesses about the telemetry formats and so on to recover the spacecraft. Out of, uh, uh, out of this unlucky, if you like, but uh, uh, situation which was, however, recovered by sheer effort, uh, there was uh, uh, then uh, the the, uh, the, the, the work of some consequences which were uh, positive, if you like. Soho initially had the three gyroscopes, mechanical gyroscopes, which are very well known for their, you know, frag fragility. One of them, I think, had already gone before we went into, uh, into the, 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 this mishap, this recovery. Um, two failed just after the recovery, after the decommissioning, the last two gyros, and without gyros, uh, uh, you know, uh, the roll axis cannot be controlled. Uh, was it for, for uh, if this would have happened say, six, seven years into the mission, probably Soho would have succumbed to the budget wars uh, that uh, rage uh, every year in NASA and everywhere, in fact, in terms of money to keep the spacecraft uh, running. But Soho, through the, uh, through the recovery, which was fairly public and made a big impression on the American public at least, uh, had become a darling, let alone, of course, the, um, the, the, the solar community, which had got all its uh, experiments back. And therefore, uh, NASA and ESA uh, you know, decided <coughs> to ask uh, uh, Madame Alcuni Space France, the prime contractor, to devise a gyroless mode, which was implemented by the end of, uh, I think, 90 beginning of mid-99, through some new software uploaded and through, you know, through this software using the Star Tracker to control, uh, to control the, the, uh, the roll axis, making Soho, in fact, the first uh, uh, spacecraft free axis stabilized, conceived for, with, for mechanical gyros, which was run, is running gyroless. And this has made uh, Soho much more reliable, much more resilient, and allowed it to stay, uh, let's say, safe and, uh, and uh, active for these 20 years. Uh, the, uh, another another um, uh, element, if you like, where you know, chance and, uh, and uh, strong effort, especially against the schedule in that case, was the, um, the, the wheels. So it was uh, four reaction wheels. In June 1995, uh, six months before the actual, actual <coughs> launch, during a very normal ground uh, functional test, the wheels, uh, uh, one of the wheels, one or two of the wheels, started screeching. I mean, high pitch noise, which every mechanical engineer knows is, uh, is uh, uh, ball bearing, asking for help. Uh, they were opened. Uh, yes, there was a problem with the ball bearing, a subtle lubrication problem, which, uh, to be honest, was really subtle. And uh, uh, it, the problem was identified. The four wheels were this taken out of the spacecraft, dismantled, uh, modified under the watchful but very helpful, for, helpful high of a couple of NASA uh, uh, experts. 
and uh, uh, re uh, you know, retested one by one and sent back to the Cape where they were installed on the space where which had in the meantime gone there because we started an early launch campaign in August. Uh, the fact that the wheels are nicely turning off uh, uh, today, 20 years uh, later, means that uh, shows the excellence of uh, the people who built and rebuilt them and also the wisdom of uh, uh, the various partners that took uh, in steps uh, the, the, the risk of flying these wheels, which had you know, a history which was not. But uh, regret about one thing. What if uh, these wheels would have uh, exhibited uh, this uh, you know, misbehavior 10 working hours later, 20 working hours I, that is in orbit? probably the wheels would have, uh, you know, had problems uh, much earlier uh, uh, and their life would have been curtailed. So again, there's been an element of chance, uh, but uh, also a lot of effort uh, within a month, hard work from industry first, but from all of us, because we had several missions, uh, we had uh, almost weekly missions there at all levels. Uh, one last uh, element of uh, where you know, this mix of uh, chance and uh, wisdom and uh, margins is also, as also been playing, is the, the 3,000 comets. Uh, Soho is the biggest uh, uh, comet discoverer of history because it has uh, managed to identify or let people identify 3,000 comets so far, uh, sun grazing. Uh, People in general cannot look at these comets because the glare of the sun is too, is too strong for the telescopes. But with the coronagraphs of Soho, you can do it. And, uh, uh, you know, amateur astronomers in many cases have identified these comets and they have been logged into the uh, archives of, uh, of the sky. Uh, so it was a, 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 an unexpected bonanza, if you like. But this bonanza was also built on two elements. <laughs> One was the fact that uh, uh, the Soho data were public. And 20 years ago, making all the data public uh, on the internet was a fairly novel approach that uh, the scientists and the community took, uh, the solar community took. And the second is that NASA, the flight operation team, performed the injection maneuver into our orbit uh, much early, in February 1996, perfect and without correction which had, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and in so doing, uh, uh, basically saved a lot of fuel, which allows, allows and allows them to uh, keep uh, working with Soho for a much longer time, 20 years. So, uh, all in all, uh, my, my <coughs> memories are in an inextricable mix of chances, but also a lot of hard work, without which, of course, the, the and the, the boundaries between the chances you take or you have to take or you don't know that you are taking and uh, the efforts is always fuzzy. So uh, the only thing you can do is to do your best, your honest best, not to, uh, not to throw away, not to reject uh, criticism because criticism, if it is well-meaning, of course, will, will, uh, will help uh, you because uh, uh, it will improve what you are doing if you can defeat the criticism. And then let fate uh, run its course. Uh, the Greek, after all, we are saying that fate is stronger than the gods. So let alone the engineers or the scientists. Uh, I think I have to uh, stop here or, uh, you know, close, come to a close and give the floor to Daniel. I could go on a, lo a long time. I could go on on uh, the uh, good cooperation we had with uh, Mata Marconi Space France which uh, I within the limits of our respective roads, which has uh, a great divide, which is called budget. But, uh, uh, and uh, also their positive attitude, uh, especially in, the, in taking the, into account the fact that uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, agency and in, an unusual high number of agency furnished equipment, which made us, uh, of course, m m weaker from a management point of view. All I could go on with the difference, with the cultural difference, with nothing handling schedule and uh, principal investigators. In, in a role for them at the time fairly you know, new, because they were junior partners in this, uh, in this mission. Or the excellent work done by the principal investigators and uh, their teams, which uh, 
forced us uh, during the, uh, the life uh, on ground of SOHO to keep their telescope basically at room temperature, but then managed to, uh, the same telescope managed to survive in the sky at plus minus 100 and be recovered, and in one case even uh, get better because uh, of the bake out of one of the detectors. So uh, there are other things that I could uh, share, but uh, SOHO is uh, as a still uh, uh, one third of its propellant. The arrays are degrading slowly and gently and much more gently than uh, we were afraid of. And there is uh, somebody that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, so interested about this data to call for it uh, uh, every day. And uh, I believe that uh, probably I can share some of his other memories if they will still be there uh, for the 25th or even 30th anniversary of so. Thank you. Very much, Fabrizio. While I'm setting up, there is still at least some wall space over there. If people feel cramped behind the door or in the um, balconies, I've even heard that you get good sound if you use the microphone. So let's try that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, 20 years of Soho, 20 years of discoveries in 35 minutes. That's a lot of ground to cover. So, because I know that you're all very smart, I figured I could show about 10 slides per minute. But, but I'm not, so I will probably deeply disappoint many people because I will not devote enough time to their favorite part of the mission, but let me give it a try anyway. So my name is Daniel Müller. I'm currently the Solar Orbiter Project Scientist, and I've been the, um, the Deputy Project Scientist for SOHO between 2005 and 2010, based as part of the ESA-NASA joint team at NASA Goddard, so working with Bernard Fleck, the SOHO Ambassador. So I've, I've learned a lot of very helpful lessons personally starting out my, my time at ESA on that mission, so I'm very grateful for that. And I think in the next 35 minutes, I'd like to take you on a gentle walk through some of the discoveries that SOHO has made, and also just share some personal inspirations I got from working in between, as a scientist, in between the engineers and the scientific community. So let's get started. So as you have heard by now, it's a joint ESA-NASA project. The satellite was built in Europe by Matra Marconi Space with instrument provided by European member states and NASA launched on the Atlas rocket almost exactly 20 years ago. And it's located at the Lagrangian point L1, which is a saddle point. It's roughly a million miles away from Earth in the direction of the sun, so that's easy to remember. So it, it traces the Earth orbit as we orbit around the sun, and it's a very benign environment. It has an uninterrupted view of the sun 24-7. And it was planned for a nominal mission lifetime of two years, which we've now exceeded by a factor of 10. And it has 12 instruments on board. And I promised myself not to bombard you with too many acronyms, so unfortunately I will not go through the instruments one by one, but I try to give you an overview. So what SOHO instruments provide are UV imaging and spectroscopy of the sun, and a particular reason for doing this from space is because the UV part of the spectrum is clearly not accessible from the ground. We image the faint outer atmosphere of the sun, the so-called corona, we measure surface motions and the magnetic field on the solar surface. We measure the composition of the solar wind by, in a way, sniffing it in situ at the location of the spacecraft, but also with one instrument by mapping the uh, Lyman alpha glow of uh, hydrogen atoms of the interplanetary medium by essentially seeing the, uh, the scattering from sunlight and thereby sampling anisotropies in the solar wind. And the last but not least, it is also an instrument to measure the total solar irradiance, which is in a way a different word for solar constant, providing a 20-year record of integrated solar activity, solar irradiance, which is a key parameter for climate models. Okay, in a nutshell, because not everyone might be familiar with the sun, it's a main sequence star. It's in many ways quite ordinary, so astronomers find it terribly boring. However, let me see if we have a pointer here. 
Yeah. It's like every star, it's a, it's a nuclear furnace. It burns hydrogen into helium in its core. So the sun is made out of roughly three quarters hydrogen, a quarter helium, and just a pinch of heavier elements. So at a temperature at the core of 15 point million degrees, it burns uh, helium out of hydrogen atoms. And this core is surrounded by what's called the radiative zone where the energy is transferred outwards by radiation. And then it has an outer shell where energy is transported by bubbling motions, also called convection, a bit like water boiling in a pot. And so going from a temperature of 15.7 million degrees in the core, we go to a surface temperature, the photosphere, that's where the photons that you see in visible light come from, of only 6,000 degrees, which is relatively little. However, the puzzling thing is that has puzzled people for many years is that why is the sun as a star, and as it turns out, many other stars, surrounded by a tenuous outer atmosphere that is more than a million degrees hot. So from a thermodynamic standpoint, this initially doesn't really make sense. So we'll try to <coughs> shed some light on that. So let's start with sunspots. This is a movie from a visible light instrument on SOHO called MDI, and it shows how the sun rotates. It rotates roughly uh, with a period of 25 days around the equator, about um, 35 days around the poles. And you see these blemishes, dark spots, that move across the surface. They were first observed around 1600, almost in parallel by Galileo Galilei, who was actually after a Mercury transit, but in instead he found a sunspot. And a German monk called Christoph Scheiner, who also discovered the same thing. You don't need a big telescope, but you do need a telescope, which is why it took uh, until 1610 for sunspots to be discovered. They didn't fit into the preferred worldview at the time, which saw the sun as an immaculate object. So People didn't like that notion, but they were simply there. And it turns out that sunspots are regions of strong magnetic field. And because the magnetic field inhibits the convective bubbling motions, uh, it cools the material. So they're dark because they are cooler spots on the surface. And if you take current instrumentation from the ground, that's a one meter optical tel telescope on the Canary Islands, you see that these things are also amazingly, amazingly pretty. They are tiny on the sun, but they're still bigger than our entire planet. And on a time scale of minutes, you see this interplay between these convective cells on the undisturbed surface and the more guided pattern when the magnetic field starts to control turbulence. So it's really, it's a plasma physics laboratory that we can look at. So why all this? The, the, the whole question is that we know that solar activity changes with time. You might have heard about it, the sunspot cycle, and e if that might even have an impact on, on, on climate. The, the point is that inside the sun, you have moving charges. And if you move charges, you generate magnetic fields. It's the inverse of what happens on your bicycle when you have a little generator to give you moving electrons to power your light. And in this case, it's called the solar dynamo. Field is amplified at the base of this convective shell. And then these bundles of intense magnetic field that are also called flux tubes rise to the surface. So to illustrate that, let me show you this little animation. So you start off with a dipolar field. It's being wrapped up by the differential motion of the sun. And starting off with an ordered field, you end up with something very tangled. And in an artist's impression, if you fly through uh, the solar surface, you could see these bundles of field lines being buoyant. And where they hit the surface, they cool it down, which makes them dark. And as you know, there are no magnetic monopoles. So all these pieces need to be connected to a different piece on the surface, unless they open up into the interstellar medium. And there's a sunspot cycle. And even though people didn't know for hundreds of years what sunspots were, they were still taking a good record of them, observing them every day. And that has helped us a lot in terms of uh, reconstructing past climate events. And if you look at the last 45 years in the space age, we could see a good periodicity of roughly 11 years in activity. That's the uh, record of the sunspot number, so a measure for the number of sunspots on the visible half of the sun. And it's a good correlation between the overall what's called the heliospheric flux, the flux in the bubble that surrounds the sun 
and Earth. It's called the heliosphere. But we have no idea what controls the exact duration of the cycle, and we have no idea about the amplitude. And for example, the last minimum was, was much deeper than any minimum that we had observed before, and it took much longer to get out of it. So the sun didn't have any spots for more than 100 days, which no one had ever seen since uh, the Maunder minimum in the uh, 1600s. I even got a call from a colleague yesterday who said we need to negotiate the operating costs and ESA's share of that for the ISS for 21 to 2024. What's your guess for the solar activity? And I would have really liked to help out by giving a profound statement, but all I could say is we still, still generally have no idea what drives the sunspot cycle. So there are indications for the next few years, but what exactly the next activity maximum will look like, we do not know. But what we do know is that the sun's magnetic field is the main driver of space weather. So the sun regularly unleashes huge clouds of plasma into space. That's on the order of a billion tons of material traveling at a speed of millions of kilometers per hour. Sometimes if it's directed towards Earth, we have to thank our own magnetic field from shielding us on the surface from these intense particle events. But we see them in the upper atmosphere. We see aurora and we see communications being affected uh, in, in the higher layers of the atmosphere. And in extreme events, satellites can actually malfunction, navigation systems can malfunction. So there's clearly even operational reasons to understand what space weather looks like. <coughs> so one of the uh, extra features of SOHO was that it has been serving as a superb space weather watchdog over the years. So these are images from the famous Halloween storms that took place around Halloween 2003 that featured the biggest flares ever measured from space, a number of X-class flares within a few days. And these are images of the corona. You see the, the regular solar wind outflow, and then every few hours you see a big CME blasting out. And those that look a bit like smoke rings that, that are circular are actually traveling in our direction, and you see these snow-like patterns on the detectors when the protons uh, permeate the shielding and actually hit the detector itself. And what you see here is planet Mercury. It's uh, saturating the, uh, the detectors. Therefore, you see this effect of CCD bleeding. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the science. Uh, three top objectives of the mission were the solar interior to find out how the interior is structured and what motions are going on, the solar corona, why does it exist at all, and how does it get heated to temperatures of more than a million degrees, and the solar wind, where is it accelerated, and by which mechanism. So let's start on the inside. How do we know what's inside the sun if we can't look at it? And the answer is a technique called heliosismology, which is similar to uh, the ordinary seismological techniques that are used on Earth, for example, to work on earthquakes and find out what the interior of our planet is made of. And the basic is that the sun is a squishy ball of plasma, and like a musical instrument, you can hit it, and it has resonances. So it rings, and it's a little bit like a bell that's not being hit with a single um, bang, but it's a bit like a, 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 um, a bell being hit by a million sand grains. So you excite all sorts of basic fundamental tones and overtones, and the sun can resonate in the multitude of frequencies. So in an exaggerated view, it looks like this. Luckily, that's not the real sun, but this is what it looks like when seen from Soho. You see this sort of grainy pattern, but there are small scale motions. There's a superposition of more than 10 million different pressure modes that all go on at the same time. So the amplitudes are on the order of kilometers per second, but you can look at them and what you need is a technique to infer uh, the interior conditions of the sun based on these frequencies. And the key here is that the resolution you get based on this Fourier decomposition goes with one over the duration of your time series. So if you do it with a single telescope from ground, you have the duration of one day if you're lucky. And from space, we had a record of almost un uninterrupted of for 15 years. You can actually detect thousands and thousands of different modes, and from these modes detect the physical parameters of the sun. So SOHO was the first mission that could really measure the, the sound speed in the interior of the sun. 
And as you know, the sound speed has to do with pressure and temperature. And if you keep in mind that um, the whole question about solar activity has to do with how the solar dynamo works, all these models had to make certain assumptions about how the sun rotates and wraps up the field lines. And before SOHO, all the models were assuming that along cylinders, all the material was rotating constantly. And SOHO showed that this is clearly wrong. The sun actually rotates differentially, not only in uh, latitude, but also going inside. And the core seems to be rotating almost like a solid body. So this might actually be a mechanism how this field gets, am gets amplified at the base of this convective envelope, because this rotating layer on the outside is, is hitting a solidly rotating layer on the inside. So you create a lot of shear, and that is probably amplifying the field. OK, and the second fundamental thing where really solar physics could do something of general relevance <coughs> was the so-called solar neutrino puzzle. So neutrinos are these elusive particles that are generated in nuclear reactions. There are amazingly many of them. So every square centimeter of your skin gets hit by 10 billion neutrinos every second. And you don't notice because they are weakly interacting particles. And they have a cross-section of 10 to the minus 45 uh, square meters. So they only weakly interact, which is why they don't do any harm to us. However, they are a key parameter of nuclear models. If you either want to understand how stars work or you want to build a fusion reactor, you need to make sure you got the equations right. And the equations for the sun uh, predicted roughly a factor of three more of these electron neutrinos that people were measuring on the ground. So either all these nuclear models were dead wrong or something must have happened to these neutrinos. And it turned out that what happened was that they come in three different flavors. So they're like three siblings, electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, and they can change their so-called flavor in mid-flight. So this was finally solved by measurements from the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which is buried 1,500 meters underground in Canada. So they had two different counting devices for the electron neutrinos and neutrinos as a whole. And they could actually show that the solar models were right and what happened were really these flavor transitions that people had hypothesized about but not, never really shown to exist in nature were going on. And ultimately, this is what the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to this year. Okay, let's move to the outer corona. There's a lot of different theories going on about what makes it hot. I'll just illustrate one that at least will is playing a major role. And this is called the magnetic carpet, or the concept that if you tangle magnetic field lines, you can uh, build up energy that then dissipates into heat. And the one thing that people had seen before is you see sunspots, but they thought outside of sunspots, there's no magnetic field. But instead, SOHO has shown that there's magnetic field on small scales everywhere. So the two different polarities are shown here in black and white. And Keep in mind, all these black dots need to be connected to some white dots somewhere. And if you picture that, it looks something like this. It's, it's a carpet where all these different polarities are connected, and these magnetic field lines are a little bit like rubber bands. You can twist them, but if you twist them too hard, they'll break. And this breaking means they just reconnect to other field lines that they find more easily to connect to. And the remaining energy is just transferred into heat. And that's more than enough to heat the corona to a million degrees. So there might be other mechanisms, but this is clearly a major one. OK, solar wind. Now we're going even further out. Solar wind is this faint outflow of material and the only way we can actually measure particles that come from the sun in situ. And one of the nice things about SOHO is that with its 12 instrument, it could look at the problem from many different angles. And this is one where using the UV spectrometer, it actually could sample the outflows at different heights in the solar atmosphere using different spectral lines in the UV and pinpoint the source of the fast solar wind to these so-called magnetic funnels. And in addition, it could also show that the solar wind, which is supersonic, is actually accelerated to its final speed, very close to the sun. Already at 10 solar radii, it has reached its supersonic speed. And um, usually, all the in situ people get shortchanged in presentations because it's much easier to show pictures than spectra. But so I'll 
promised to show at least one. This is solar wind composition um, from the Celia sensor. You can see here the atomic mass units and the counts. And so the solar wind, of course, has um, alpha particles, electrons, protons, but also heavier elements. And many of those, including titanium, iron, nickel, uh, chromium, they were actually for the first time detected with the Celius instrument. So of course, they must be there somewhere, but it was not clear whether you could actually detect them in situ. And um, if we now move on to something a bit more practical, um, an interesting aspect of that is that if you have a radiation storm, that's typically a mix of electrons, protons, and heavier ions. But what people that are involved in human space flight are mostly worried about are the heavy particles because they actually um, are a health risk for astronauts. And the thing is, electrons are so much lighter than protons that they're accelerated more easily and just flow uh, more quickly to the spacecraft. So scientists developed a technique whereby they take the electron data and build a forecast matrix which can give us roughly an hour uh, advance notice for incoming proton storms. So that's enough to be used by, by NASA's Johnson Space Center to, as an operational tool to at least warn people at the ISS not to, for example, embark on any outside activities if a radiation storm is on its way. So one hour is not enough, but if this is the best you have, then one hour can actually be sufficient. Okay, so the last... Um, really firm and hard number that SOHO has been able to establish is the total solar radiance that I measured earlier on. So this plot shows since 1980 the total solar radiance in watt per square meter over time. So you clearly see the blue one is the SOHO part with the instrument called Virgo and the others are from previous instruments on other missions, Actium 1 and 2. And you can clearly see the 11 year cycle. You can also see a lot of fluctuations on the short time scale. It's immensely difficult to absolutely calibrate because you really need to take care of all the stray light contributions. But the key message here is that over three solar cycles of these measurements, the solar cycle variations have been on the order of 0.06%. And there's no non-zero trend at three sigma level. So to together with the proxies that we get from sunspot activity over the last a few hundred years, it's very unlikely based on this data that the sun had any significant influence on global warming. And there might be additional components, for example, UV forcing and solar wind forcing that cannot be ruled out based on that data. But because the, the solar constant is in a way like the wattage of your light bulb that drives our climate, on this one, the facts are simple and hard that there's no trend beyond a flat average. Okay, so I would now like to change gears a bit and just show you a bit of the beauty of the sun. Just a bit something lighter moving towards lunch. Um, these are movies from the UV imaging telescopes called EIT. This shows the sun in the helium Lyman alpha line, 304 angstroms. That's plasma around 60 to 80,000 degrees. You can see, for example, the so-called prominences that often sit above the sun, suspended by magnetic forces for weeks, and then break out into space. And on the right, you see plasma at around a million degree Kelvin. That's eight to nine times ionized iron ions. Um, and you can see here these uh, loop-like structures. These are really magnetic field lines being illuminated by glowing plasma. And this is a third line, it's in 195 angstrom. Again, it's, it's from, from iron ions. And this takes us back to the Halloween storms from 2003. So you can see here some brightenings where uh, magnetic field lines reconnect in solar flares and then unleash coronal mass ejections that then eventually hit the detector in this little snowstorm. So in the corona, the same event looks like this. You can see these sort of longer lasting streamer outflows and then in between you see these coronal mass ejections. <coughs> the white circle that's the sun that's being blocked out with an occulter. So we can see the faint emission here. So that's less than a millionth of the intensity of the sunlight. But if you can block it out, you can actually see the faint structures. And especially in the wide field of view, you can see a lot of stars. And in this case, Mercury again as a planet. And because you can so, see so many faint objects 
in this data. So, like Fabrizio said earlier, has also doubled as a very prolific comet hunter. So people have looked at the data because it was available uh, publicly from day one. And um, they've discovered more than 3,000 comets from different families. Most of these are so-called sun-grazing comets. So they fly by the sun. If they are lucky, they survive the encounter. And if they are unlucky, they get, for example, hit by a CME and just lose their tail. And if they are even more unlucky, then something like this happens. This was in 2013. This was a comet that was supposed to be one of the brightest ever. And as you see, it was bright, but it got completely disintegrated in its passage around the sun. So luckily, that was not Rosetta. <laughs> and we've also developed a tool. It's called J Helio Viewer that allows people to just put together easily visual data from different missions. For example, this one is Soho combined with SDO. And so you can actually make these movies yourselves really easily. And this is a nice animation that our colleagues at NASA made for the uh, 3000 comet discovery about six weeks ago. And all comets are these sort of streaks of the last 10 years. Some have a label that are those that had been known previously. And all streaks that have no labels are new comets that have been discovered from SOHO data. And another more curious feature, if people look at data very carefully and have a certain inclination to find interesting things, people might also find other things. <laughs> so, so this was the one event where we were actually very grateful that NASA, uh, that this was in the public eye identified as a NASA spacecraft rather than an ESA one. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it caused, especially in the, in the United States, a major media echo that people were sure on NASA cameras UFOs had been found. And in Europe, the reaction was a bit more subtle, but even BBC put, picked it up and didn't rule it out and said, well, people believe they've spotted UFOs. And so it took a bit of convincing that this was not a UFO, but something that can easily be explained. And, and this is a simple image from the EIT telescope. And this simply happens to be a hot pixel. If you blow it up, it looks like this. And you, all you need to do is to interpolate it. And you see where this is going. You just apply a color table. And there goes your UFO. <laughs> so uh, UFO is self-made in five minutes. And it looks exactly like what was reported uh, in the news. And it still took a considerable effort to convince the media outlets that this is the natural explanation, but ultimately CNN picked it up and said, okay, you can make it yourself, and this is why it's there. Although there's always this 1% of the population, at least in the US, that believe that this is still just governments conspiring to hide evidence. Okay, so let me converge a bit more to the topic of 20 years of Soho. There's a lot of statistics one could do. What I find impressive is that, I mean, we got more than 5,000 refereed scientific papers out of SOHO results. It's really uh, one of the top missions in terms of productivity. More than 250 people received their PhDs based on SOHO, analyzing SOHO data. A lot of commands sent to the spacecraft. The LASCO instruments had uh, more than a million pictures taken. A lot of data being served insane amount of meetings. Luckily, I don't think every, any single, single person attended all of them. As Fabrizio said, we have no gyroscopes. But, and I think I'm allowed to say that because I'm a scientist who was not involved in building the mission. I think it's simply really an amazing spacecraft that is still going strong after 20 years. So we got a lot of good attention from, from the media. It's clearly an advantage of a mission that produces pictures rather than just wiggly lines. And we also had a number of interesting unofficial fanware articles. And because all the images are available for everyone just to use and reuse and share, we got a lot of uh, unintended publicity from like CD covers, uh, iPod shells, and I think it's the only mission, at least to my knowledge, which has a snowboard. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and um, 
So success has really paved the way for a number of new solar missions. We've learned an insane amount of new things from SOHO, but there's always the next step, the next step in resolution, the next step in spectral coverage. So based on SOHO's success, NASA decided to build the twin stereo spacecraft. Uh, JAXA flew Hinode as the NASA SDO mission. And again, in a collaboration with NASA, we are right now building the solar orbiter mission that will be launched in a few years. That in, a, in the final part of the presentation, I'd like to reconnect to what Fabrizio said earlier, that without luck and efforts, most of this story would, would never have happened. And so let me take you back to June 1998. SOHO was in deep trouble because of a series of operational errors. It was lost. It was simply gone. People had no idea what was going on. Was the orbit disturbed? Was it spinning? And if so, how? What was the temperature? And so for four long weeks, no signal from SOHO. And um, the first glitter of hope was the detection by our receiver radar. So this is this huge radio dish in Puerto Rico that you might know from the James Bond movie, <coughs> Golden Eye. They used it in um, inverse mode in the way that they sent a massive radio pulse into the direction where SOHO was last seen and waited for an echo. And they did detect an echo, and from the echo, from the shape of the spectral line, they could deduce the spin rate. And the impressive thing is that, I mean, after these four weeks, most people had actually given up. There were NASA people in meetings that had shook their heads and, and left. But the one person among several who decided that simply giving up was not an option was Roger Bonnet, that's our former director of science, who is still widely being admired for many things, but among those was that Soho was really his baby, and he told the people, okay, if you need resources, I'll give you the resources, but I want the spacecraft back. So you don't come back to me without the spacecraft. And he said that again and again. And sometimes this is really what it takes to, to make it happen. So on 3rd of August, 40 days after loss of contact, a faint signal was being picked up, both by the Deep Space Network and also by the ESA Perth station. So the situation was like that, that SOHO was spinning around this axis. The sun was illuminating the solar rays edge on, and that's not a good thing. Um, the faint hope was that if you wait for a month or two, it would move around the sun, and so when it spins like this, you would at least get a little bit of sunshine during half of each, each spin period. And the instruments, they then received housekeeping telemetry. Some of the instruments got boiling hot. Others got extremely cold. I mean, way outside of any reasonable qualification temperature. And the entire hydrogen tank was frozen. 200 kilograms of hydrogen frozen liquid. Um, so the key challenge was how to get enough power to get the spacecraft operational again. And then they decided to try and thaw the tank with the equivalent of a light bulb. And in two weeks, they had piece by piece thawed all the hydrogen. And it was achieved to recover the sun pointing attitude in September. And so the, these guys really did it. And this is really highly remarkable. It's really one of the most stunning rescue and recovery efforts since, I would say, Apollo 13. Um, they recommissioned the spacecraft and the instrument, and miraculously, all instruments still worked. This is, this is, I think, uh, really a miracle, but it also shows if you build an instrument really well, at least you stand a chance that it can survive an environment that it hasn't been designed for. And the adventure wasn't quite over yet because, as Fabrizio pointed out, in December, the mission lost its last gyroscope. And then there were simply just very few days left to devise a solution, and the engineers came up with the idea of running a completely new attitude and orbit control system without gyros. And so SOHO became, by pure necessity, the first three-axis stabilized spacecraft without gyros, and it's been running really smoothly ever since. And more than 160 people have been involved from ESA, Matra Marconi Space, NASA, and other entities. And this is just a picture of some of them. And especially as a scientist, I really tip my head to these great engineers that, that made it happen. And some of these people are in the room. Some of these people I actually have the honor worth working with almost every day, even today on Solar Orbiter. And I think this is amazing. And there were many reactions received also from the general public, just a few because I think they illustrate the situation quite well. 
people really followed it. This was before the word blog was even known, but the team posted live updates every day on the internet and people followed that and it was really a sort of a, an amazing story. And I like this one in particular because it says, the success and your postings have re-energized my interest in the man component of space exploration. I think really if we can do something that has such an impact on people, I think this is great. And um, this is one that you need to take in the temporal context. You have to remember that this was November 1998. Great kudos for a job well done. Check with Clinton. I think he needs you guys now. So for those who might not remember, this was the middle of the Monica Lewinsky affair. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so to conclude, I would like to show you just some nice pictures of the next generation. This is uh, data from the SDO mission, which essentially stepped up two of these SOHO instruments to new orders of magnitude. They fly 16 megapixel cameras instead of one, and they get uh, 1.4 terabyte of data per day instead of 200 megabyte. This is Mercury transit. But in principle, this is only made possible by SOHO. And the one remarkable thing is they had planned to fly a coronagraph. And then NASA figured we need to save money. Why not keep SOHO running? Because it would be much cheaper to keep SOHO running. And in the end, SOHO uh, SDO flew with no coronagraph. And I think at least for this reason alone, people would like to keep SOHO running for as long as possible. And at least from the data we have today, it looks like we might be here again in 10 years for 30 years of SOHO. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. Okay. I should maybe add that all of this would not have happened without the diligent help of Fabrizio and his perseverance because there are other people who were saying before May you cannot get any room for a lunch lecture but he made it happen. <laughs> <laughs>